Today's scripture is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings should be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and, human, and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. This is the word of the Lord. So last week we talked about uh, Timothy chapter 1, which was sort of Paul's introduction to what this whole thing is about. Um, and through that, he really tries to center Christ um, as that center of the church um, that he is trying to help build, um, and that church is meant to follow in the ways of Christ. Um, and in order to do that, in order to follow in the ways of somebody, you first have to be kind of looking that direction. Uh, and so Paul kind of gave us last week this direction to be, instead of always constantly looking up to those above us who are looking up to those who above them and on and on up the line, um, he says we actually are all meant to be looking together towards the center. Um, and I always love that imagery, and I think it's a beautiful imagery of people kind of standing in a circle looking towards the center, because the other thing you are doing when you're all looking towards the center is you're also all looking at each other. Um, and in many ways, that's what the church is meant to be about. Um, we don't have the benefit um, that the original disciples had 2,000 years ago of actually having Christ in physical form with us, that person that we could then look to. Um, so in many ways, when we are looking together towards the center of Christ, we are look also looking at each other and seeing Christ in each other. And in many ways, I think that is the most beautiful depiction of the church. So Paul gives us that um, as the idea, and then throughout the rest of the letter, he starts to give us some practical things about how we live that out. Um, and if you notice at the beginning of this chapter, it says, first of all. So that means Paul is kind of done with the introduction, done with the overview of what he's doing, um, and he's kind of getting down to business um, in that more practical way. Um, and the very, very first thing that Paul brings up is he brings up this idea that in order to be church, in order to do church, we have to pray. And that's what he starts with, is we have to pray. Um, but not only that we have to pray, which should kind of go without saying for most of us, we'd hope that's something we do around here, but we have to pray uh, in a specific way, which is we have to pray for other people. And he goes on to say, you need to pray for everyone, um, and then also for magistrates and kings and people in authority. Now, at that time, it would have been expected um, that everybody uh, is meant to give prayers um, or give offerings or whatever part of your religious practice is um, to kings and magistrates. In fact, they pretty much demanded it of you. Now, they themselves likely didn't care if you actually did this. They assumed everybody did, um, and they assumed that their position came to them um, usually because they were important or special or whatever it was. Um, 
But the reality is that at this time, the very, very small handful of people, which would have been like less than like two or three percent of the total population, would have been in that kind of elite class. Most of them didn't really spend a lot of time caring about what the people below them were doing. So when Paul writes and he says, don't forget to pray for these people, it's not because he thinks the king really cares or is going to be affected by those prayers either way. But when it says, he, when he goes on and he says, you do this so that we may lead this certain life. And part of what he says in there is like, we may lead a life of dignity, which is also means a life of some respectability of the people around us. So Paul is not hiding from the responsibilities of the time, um, that they are, everyone is expected in some way um, to give reverence to those above them. So he says, fine. In many ways, Paul is okay with acknowledging the way things are, acknowledging the, what the common practices of the day, and acknowledging that sometimes what we need to do is just go along with those things so we can pay attention to the more important things. So the radical part of Paul's statement isn't that we should pray for magistrates or rulers. Everybody's doing that. It's that we should also pray for everyone. And by everyone, he means everyone. And that is not something that would have been as common during the time. At the time Paul is writing, you definitely cared about yourself. You probably cared about your immediate family and those sorts of things. Um, and everybody else was sort of on their own. And when Paul is going to help us to live a life where we have centered Christ, the life where we're actually looking at each other and seeing Christ with each other, that means we actually have to kind of care about each other and we have to care about people we're not used to caring about. And so the radical part of Paul's statements um, and the thing that is he's trying to change is not that we should keep doing what we've been doing, but that we also need to do a little bit more. And the little bit more we need to do is we need to pray for everybody, even those we don't know, and preferably, and even those we don't like. Most of us probably don't want to spend time thinking about people we don't like. And no doubt when I talk and I say, bring up the idea of people we don't like, somebody probably came to your mind right now. And I'm not asking you who. <laughs> but it doesn't take us long, most of us, to think of somebody we don't like or who bothers us. Um, and so when Paul says pray for everybody, he means not only those that you already love and have affection for, um, but he means those whom, whom you maybe don't love so much and have a struggle finding affection for. And this is a real struggle at that point, and I believe it is still a struggle for us today. I remember many, many years ago um, in my church uh, in Billings, um, I had a woman come to me. She'd come to church for a while, um, and initially she was kind of a, she hadn't been Methodist. She hadn't really been around our church. I'm not entirely certain how she found us, um, but she liked this notion of the church being open. She liked the idea um, that we weren't about excluding people. She liked the idea that we were about a loving um, and helping people to love, and she liked all of that um, until, it, until she started to have a struggle. Then she came to my office, and she's like, so... I have a question for you. I'm like, great. I always love it when people come and ask me a question because it's either something really, really simple or impossible to answer. And this was kind of both. Uh, and she came to my thing and she's like, yeah, I know you talk about God loving everybody. And I'm like, yes. And I'm like, and God wants best for everybody. And I'm like, yes. Uh, I'm like, yes, so far two for two, you're doing great. And she's like, okay, well, as a profession, uh, she was an EMT, so she drove around in the ambulances um, in Billings. And one of the things that if you're in, especially any kind of like that kind of role, um, you learn that these are both incredibly essential services that save lives on a daily basis, and there's a small handful of frequent flyers that you have to deal with on a regular basis. And so she started to talk to me about one of the frequent flyers um, that she, they got called out to on a fairly routine, routine basis that was in her little area um, and the challenge she was having with this person because they seemed to be continually making poor choices that put themselves in difficult situations and they kept coming back over and over and over again to the same place and they would find themselves over and over and over again um, having to serve this person in the same way and it had been going on for years and she was deeply, deeply frustrated. Why can't this person just get their life together? And so she's like, when you say God loves everybody, do you also mean Bill? And Bill's not his real name. <laughs> I changed his name, and I don't know why I chose Bill. Bill. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> it even says on my notes, Bill quotes. All right. <laughs> but, you know, distract myself sometimes. Anyway, 
And I'm like, yes, I do. And she's like, really? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, well, what does that mean? I mean, it means that you, like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, what am I supposed to do with that? How am I supposed to love him? He drives me so crazy. He keeps making these poor choices. He keeps doing this thing over and over again. Um, and I'm like, well, part of loving somebody is wanting good for them, wanting better for them if they are struggling, wanting health and healing for them if they are struggling. And I'm like, yes, but I think, and, and her challenge was, she's like, yes, but I think I want that for him more than he wants it for himself. And I'm like, I understand. And that is a struggle. And how blessed, is, how blessed are you that you were in a place to see that? And what else must be going on in Bill's life that he can't see that for himself? We are all only get to see this deep into any person's life. The only life that we really truly know is our own. And once we leave that space, we must confess that we cannot actually see anything and everything that is going on. And we certainly cannot see any and all the struggles other people are facing. So Bill may or may not ever get his life together. He may or may not find a way out of this cycle. But that does not mean that we are relieved of our responsibility of wanting that for him. Now, at a certain point, we are all kind of in charge of us. And there are certain things we can only do for ourselves. But being part of a community of faith, and being a person of faith is, me, is being willing and open to being loving and caring as we can to help love people into those places where they can make the choices for themselves that they need to make. Sometimes we are able to do this well. Sometimes they are able to receive it. Sometimes we are not able to do it well. And sometimes they are not able to receive it. Paul doesn't say, go fix everybody and fix everybody's life. Paul says, pray for everybody, want good for everybody, want better for everybody, want health and grace and peace and love and healing for everybody, and put that want and desire into practice, into your thoughts on a regular basis, so that we can start seeing life that way and start seeing care and concern for each other that way. That, would, that is what it means to pray for everybody, even the bills in our life. And again, sorry, Bill. I pray for you too. So one of the barriers, so he sees that there are barriers that we put up to doing this well. So Paul says, first pray for everybody, and he recognizes that's hard, because there's barriers we erect for ourselves in being able to do that. And then he goes, and the next section doesn't honestly maybe initially feel connected to the section we just read, but in fact it is, because he goes to take down some of the strong barriers that we tend to put up for ourselves. Now Paul addresses this in terms of men and women. That's a problem. It was a problem, honestly, 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote it. It's especially a problem for us today because the traits that he is talking about, the challenges, the ways that we can put barriers up are not unique to men and women. And in fact, I have met men and women both who do all of these things. So do not feel like you are exempted um, if you are not part of the gender that Paul is talking about um, in this regard. Um, even at the time, it wasn't true, and it certainly is not true today. Now, as we talked about at the beginning, there are parts of our scripture that are harder to deal with because they are very much of their time. And there is a temptation. I was talking uh, to my fiance, Emily, who's also a pastor, um, about this. And she's like, what are you preaching on? And I told her and she went to read it. And she's like, why? <laughs> why don't you just stop at eight? Why are you keeping going? And I'm like, because we need that section. Section is like, do you really? Do you really need it? Um, and she had mentioned that I've actually encountered this too. That there are people in life who will simply go to those sections of the Bible they don't like and just take a little pen and just mark it right out. Now, you're welcome to do that if you so desire. Um, I don't often feel like I have that, um, that opportunity. Um, and the challenge there is that we can then sometimes lose out on the wisdom there. So as Kathy so kindly pointed out for us at the beginning, I don't care if you braid your hair. If you want to braid your hair, braid your hair. Though I don't think I see anybody with braided hair, so that's kind of disappointing. So, oh, oh there we go. I love you, Faye. I know. I don't care. That's not, believe it or not, that's not what this is about. And actually, what these, what these scriptures help us remind us is that that surface level reading, like, okay, if I don't braid my hair, I'm fine, is not actually what Paul is talking about. It wasn't what he was talking about 2,000 years ago, and it's not what he's talking about now. What he's talking about, actually, in both of these passages are the ways that we can build up our own inward and outward barriers uh, to being the kind of people that Christ calls us to be. 
Now, first, he has some advice, and he talks about, um, so first of all, Christian community at this time, 2,000 years ago, as it will be throughout, is a weird place, because it is a place where a diverse group of people come together, Um, and it's especially a place where rich people and poor people and people from different backgrounds and all that kind of stuff intermingle. They intermingle in a church in a way that they don't do almost anywhere else in society at the time. So the church, these faith communities that Paul is helping create is already this odd space where there is a much greater diversity of folks um, than people are used to dealing with. Um, And what Paul is no doubt seeing is that people are sometimes struggling with that reality um, and they're finding ways to figure out how to divide themselves. And so first he has some advice to saying, when you come into worship, we are to raise our hands in praise So when we pray, we are to raise our hands to God and not be, as it says, speaking out of anger, or sometimes the scripture says quarrelsomeness, which is a good word, although it's hard to say, or any of those other things. Now, Cod is saying this for, for, now Paul is saying this to us for a purpose, because when we go and we approach things in anger, we are going with all of our defenses up right? If we were already upset about something, right, and we go to interact with anybody else, right, all of our defenses inside of us are already up and moving, and everything is, and we are protecting ourselves, and whatever that thing we are angry about is, we think we are right, and we will defend our rightness. But when we lift our hands, when we let go of the anger, when we stop worrying so much if we are in fact right and our rightness, When we do that, then there's a chance that God can enter our lives, that the Holy Spirit can move, and we may may learn something important. The The pose that God, Paul asked people to take, that when you pray or when you praise to lift your hands up, is a very vulnerable position to be. When someone is surrendering, whether physically, emotionally, or otherwise, what do we tell them to do? Put your hands up. It is the least aggressive, most vulnerable pose we can have. And it feels that way, and it feels uncomfortable to many of us to be in that position, which is why we don't spend a lot of our time doing it. So when Paul says to lift your hands, he's not saying just physically lift your hands. There are churches for which that is a big deal. That's how you sing. You sing with your hands up. That's great if you want to do that. But it's not about lifting your hands for the sake of lifting your hands. It's about making sure that we are not entering worship. We're not entering church. We're not entering faith community with all of our barriers, all of our defenses on high alert, ready to take on anybody who might try to come after us. That in order for us to center God, to center each other, love each other, pray for each other the way that God wants us to, we first have to lower those emotional defenses inside. So Paul says, check yourself on this. How are you entering this space in this time? How are you interacting in this community? Are you spending all of your time worrying and anxious about those around you and what they might do or what they might take to you or whatever all of that might be? Or is your heart and mind opened to their fellow people around you, and more importantly, to the hands of God. Because we cannot be both open and angry at the same time. We can only be one or the other. Now, the other one he talks about is he talks about this idea of putting on costly apparel. And he talks about this idea, and what he's basically talking about there is he's talking about this idea that we can actually physically put on our bodies uh, markings that say, we are this kind of person, we are belong to this group of people, just in case you happen to belong to another group and you need to know. Now, this is, not, this is still something that happens today. Recently, um, I had to take a trip um, for a a conference, uh, and I got to take it on a small little airplane. And the interesting thing about flying on small little airplanes um, is that there's only one class of seating on that airplane, right? And so we're all in the same boat, right? There's only windows and aisles. There's only coach, right? Everybody getting on that plane, we're all in the same thing. The only question is how far or how close or far you are from the front door. That's it. And I like flying on those kinds of planes. I don't like having middle seat anxiety if I can avoid it. 
right? Um, now, as I so I flew there, I flew to the I flew to where I was going, and then I had to fly back actually that same evening, and it was also a small little plane. I'm like, okay, this is great, um, and I'm like, so I don't have to worry about anything. So I go and I get on the plane, um, and this plane apparently was just slightly bigger than the last plane. And somehow they had just slightly managed to cram four, clap, four, clap, four first class seats into the front of this thing. And then, of course, you enter in the front of the plane, so we all get to walk past the first class seats in order to go sit in the back, which were just slightly closer together, I felt. <laughs> Striving Clyde or every room. There are still some spaces where there clearly are still today some class divides. Literally, we call them classes, right? There's first class, business class, economy class. They don't call it coach anymore, which I guess is nice. And so it's easy in those places to see um, where, those, where those physically show up um, in that way. But they show up in smaller ways, too. Uh, yesterday, we uh, took the kids to Waterworld, which I had not been to before, which is quite a thing. Um, I, I feel like I did a pretty good job on my sunscreen, feeling good about that. Uh, uh, but we went, um, and it was a good time. And we were, you know, one of the things you have to do um, at Waterworld is you've got to, like, carry your tube. So you go to the bottom of the ride, and then you have to grab a tube, and then you carry it to the top of the ride so you can ride it down. Unless you pay a little extra, and then you can get tube valet. <laughs> Very fancy. Now, this is a thing at most places, right? I mean, most amusement parks now have a pay a little bit more and skip part of the line or all of the line or skip out some of the work thing. Yeah, that, that's, that's not uncommon. What differentiated this one um, was in order to keep things straight, there were the yellow tubes that everybody was on, um, but in order, I'm sure, for their organizational purposes, if you were tube valet, then your tube was red. And it took about 30 seconds for my 13-year-old daughter to figure out that as we were waiting at the end of the ride in order to get our tube, who had paid the money and who hadn't. And she's like, and the first time somebody came down on a red tube, I'm like, she's like, I'm, I was like, what are those? I'm like, oh, I think those are two to LA tube. And she literally looked at me and be like, must be nice. And I'm like, sweetheart, do you know how much it costs to get in here without two belly? There are five of us now. Like, this is not a cheap thing to do. So uh, I'm glad that those people had a little bit more than we did. Uh, but there are all these subtle markers. We live a life where there's all these subtle markers about who's in and who's out and who has what and who doesn't. I was reminded as I was coming, putting this together, um, part of when I was in Ohio, my church had a food pantry. Um, we were running short on volunteers, uh, and I called up one of my friends who was a youth pastor at this big down, big suburban church. Um, they had a big youth group, and I said, would you want to bring your youth group down to work on, at, our, uh, at our food pantry? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, that would be great. Um, and I don't know um, where those kids came from uh, and what they were doing immediately prior to working at my downtown urban uh, Rust Belt uh, Columbus, uh, you know, interesting people food pantry and church. But it was not anywhere like that. And these young people were wonderful and they actually worked really, really hard and I appreciated it. But when the first one came in dressed to the nines with hair coiffed in the Louis Vuitton bag, I was like, this is not... Okay, this, this, this could be interesting. Let's see how this goes. And, uh, I, I, and the, the challenge I realized, and talking with my friend afterwards, um, she recognized immediately that she had not adequately prepared her kids for where it is they were going or what it is they were doing. She was kind of embarrassed about it. I told her, don't worry. Um, and... Uh, that next time they came to volunteer, uh, things looked a little different. It's already going to be incredibly apparent in a situation like that, who is serving and who is being served. It is already awkward enough for those who are coming to receive to know that they're on the receiving end and the, uh, and the ones being served are on the serving end. When we don't pay attention to how we present ourselves, if we are blessed to be in the position of being the servers, then we can make that even worse. John Wesley had some very specific device, advice for us um, around this in his writings when he talked about how it is we are to be out in the world serving, because John Wesley was all about that. Um, and he basically said um, that we should be so close and so like those who we are serving we should be so close and like the poor that we are confused for them. 
so that you cannot, by just seeing, tell the difference between who is who. I think when, we, when, we, when God looks down at us, God is smart enough and wise enough to look past our clothes and the cars we drive and the bank account balances and all the other things that we use and our sports affiliations and whatever it is that we use to divide each other and ourselves. We are blessed to serve a God who doesn't see any of that. And if we are going to be like God, then we have to recognize that we do. And so when Paul says to pray for everybody, he means everybody. When Paul says to stand in a circle looking at Christ through each other, he means it. And when Paul says, make sure that you are not so internally guarded, make sure your hearts and minds are open, and also make sure that you are not, through your clothing, your apparel, your appearance, whatever it is you are, putting up barriers to other people. There are plenty of churches. There are plenty of spaces and places where somebody walking in in jeans and t-shirt would immediately feel like they do not belong. Some of us have had that experience. I am grateful we are not one of those places. I am grateful that we, we create space for any and all, and I don't care so long as all your bits are covered how you come into this building. <laughs> if you are here to worship God and learn a little bit more about what that is, then I am grateful you are here because I believe God is grateful that you are here. That is the kind of community and space that God is trying to open up and build for us all. There is no first class business class or coach in heaven. There is no first or business class coach in the church. We all receive the same love and the same grace, whether we earned it or did not, deserved it or not. We are lucky. We are blessed to be in such a place. Getting there, preparing ourselves and our hearts and minds is hard. And the best place and the, most, the best way to get that done, though, is to do what God and Paul asked us to do. To make sure that we are praying, and we are praying for everybody. Praying for those we already know and love, those we have not met yet, those whom are in a position of authority over us, those for whom we are in a position of authority over, and those who bug us, and those who seem like hopeless cases. Because when we tra pray for them in the way that God wants us to pray, then we are truly centering Christ in the way that Christ wants us to, and we can truly, truly say we are doing church. Amen.